Hey everybody, it's Derek Lamarck from CodeOpinion.com. Software as a service often means using a multi-tenant architecture. There are many different ways that you can isolate a tenant's compute and data storage. I'll show a few different options and why identity can play a significant role. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more info on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. If you're new to my channel, I post videos on software architecture and design. So if you're into those topics, make sure to subscribe. At any point you find this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. So first let's talk about a single tenant. Now this may be an individual user, if we're just talking about consumers or if it's more of a business and organization, a multi user environment, it's still a single tenant. And then the app compute, I'm talking about the actual application you're running application and storage. This could be your database, could be other things like a cache. And throughout this video, when I show compute there, that doesn't necessarily mean you have a single node for your compute. This could be a load balanced environment. Regardless, we're talking about the compute resources that are specific for a tenant. So if you've built kind of a single tenant environment and you need to move to a multi-tenant environment, the kind of commonplace scenario that you would go to is just replicating that entire environment for another tenant, meaning that you'll have a whole separate uh, compute instances, separate data storage, so meaning that both tenants are completely siloed. Now this has some advantages of that they're just completely siloed environments and then you don't necessarily worry about one tenant accessing another tenant's database or using the resources, the compute resources of another tenant. But exactly on the opposite flip side, the trade-off here is that you may be using uh, very little compute resources for a tenant if they're not using the application very much. Uh, so tenant one here may be leveraging 80% of their compute and tenant two may be barely using your application and you still have that cost of that compute. Um, whether you're in a cloud environment or not, it's still cost. Um, so you're basically kind of underutilizing resources but it has the benefit of being completely siloed. So the next logical step, if you wanna leverage compute um, and maximize compute is have each tenant use the same app, the same compute resources. And then behind that, your app will decide, depending on the tenant, which database to go to. So databases are siloed, your data siloed, but the actual compute is shared. So you're leveraging more of your app compute uh, between tenants and then siloing out for their data. Another option is just partitioning the data. So instead of having siloed data, instead we have the same database or same data storage, but rather what we're doing is each tenant is leveraging the same instance or the same database. And what this means is, for example, if we're talking about a relational database, but this could be a document database, the same type of thing, is that we're segregating data and partitioning data within that data storage. So in this case of say an order table, we have a tenant ID, an order ID, and the rest of our columns, but that tenant ID is that partition key. That's how we're partitioning our data is by a tenant. So we can see that the first and third records are for a particular tenant, T1, as just I described it here, and our other data is for different uh, tenants. So meaning that we have data for various tenants all within the same data storage, but we're partitioning them by this tenant ID. So regardless of whether you're pooling your data or you're partitioning your data or really your compute for that matter too, it, a lot of this comes down to identity and understanding a request in the kind of the context of the request for what partition, what tenant it belongs to. So what this means that if we're talking about an API, that's our computer service, when our user logs in, hits our identity service, that token that we're giving back to it, some type of key contains some identity that can tell us what the tenant ID is that we're particularly partitioning on or however we're siloed. That means that when we make a request to our compute, we're sending that key along there. And if we're using that key in a partition sense, when we make that request to say, select a particular set of data, we're using that tenant ID as our partition key, just like in the table this I described uh, before, to only return the relevant records. And I'll show an example of this later in, in .NET and C Sharp. So if we're talking about it being siloed, the same type of thing happens here, is that we're giving our key back to our user or whatever uh, our client is, that when we send back to compute, our compute can decide at that point, okay, based on the tenant, I know I'm going to this database or I need this connection string. So it can decide that at that point. So regardless of whether it's pooled or partitioned, 
having an identity of what the tenant is, that's who's the, the context of making the request, is really important. So as an example, what that looks like in code, specifically with Entity Framework in C Sharp, is that I have this order DB context and it takes a token. Inside the token, I have a tenant ID. So that has to get passed to the constructor of our order DB context. In the on model creating what I have here is this is built into EF core is that we have this query filter. And what this means is that any queries that we perform on our order model here, data model, is that it's gonna automatically filter it by that tenant ID uh, that we provided in our token. So what I've done here as in a, to, to illustrate this is I've just written some tests here and to even go farther to illustrate this, how this works with a service collection is just you're creating, you're basically registering a delegate, which I've created as the tenant factory um, that's gonna create our new instance. And our usage actually looks like this, is that we're basically creating a new uh, instance of our uh, database with the factory passing in the token. So again, any query that we make automatically is gonna be filtering by our partition key, which is our tenant ID. So as we can see in our test here, I basically have tenant one where I'm just creating a new GUID as the uh, tenant ID. I'm adding an order. I do the same thing for another tenant with a completely different GUID. And then when I fetch out orders, I have no filter here. When I fetch out the orders, I actually only get one. These two orders are never returned as a part of our filter because it's automatically built in with this query filter. If your data was siloed, this would be fairly similar is that instead of having the query filter, when you're connecting and uh, creating your instance, you'd be wanting to change what the connection string is to point to the right instance based off the tenant. Now, obviously this has some logic around it and how you do this, whether you want to reach out to a separate service to figure out what the connection string is. I'd much prefer having something stateless where I didn't have to add that latency and uh, potential failure there to, to reach out to another service. But again, the model's still the same here is that you need identity, you need context of the user making the request so that you can make the appropriate call, whether it's be a query filter or a connection. Another option is using hypermedia. And I'm gonna show this in two different ways. The first is with an HTTP API. So when our client makes a request to our identity service and it gets back that token that identifies, like we were mentioning before, our tenant, it's also gonna identify what hosts we're actually making our HTTP requests to. Because since we're not building our actual URIs, this information is provided to us. So a part of that response is where you're saying, you're going to be hitting, for example, app1.foo.com. And that's a particular app um, compute and data storage in its own particular lane. So when we make our request, just like we're normally doing, we're making it to specifically now app1.foo.com, and it's gonna just hit that data storage. Now, again, this data storage at this point could be um, siloed. In my example, maybe it's not, maybe it's partitioned, but we're basically leveraging, telling the client where what the host is it's actually gonna hit, which can be, we could scale this out infinitely to have different hosts for different tenants. If you're not creating HTTP APIs, but rather you have something like MVC, we're actually serving HTML. This means when a user physically goes in their browser and goes to log into your system, so the main part of your site, once you've authenticated them, you're then redirecting them to the appropriate host for that tenant. That means that once they log in, they'll be redirected to app.foo.com. This means that all their traffic at that point is going through that lane. The benefit of this approach, whether it's an HTTP API or it's just HTML, uh, like on a regular web app, is that these lanes allow you some flexibility in terms of deployment. When you decide to uh, publish an update, you can be doing so to app1.foo.com and see how that resonates, or maybe there's some experiment you wanna do in that particular part of the app, and it's not affecting all of your tenants. You're doing this kind of on a lane by lane basis and deciding, okay, there's these X amount of tenants that are, we're gonna experiment with um, or try a new feature on, or even just we're deploying and we wanna make sure that everything's fine there. You can do that to kind of one lane, one grouping at a time. So hopefully this illustrated that there are many different ways to deal with a multi-tenant environment. You can silo data, you can partition data, you can pool compute, you can pool compute by a set of tenants and create different lanes. There are a lot of different options. Things that I didn't even mention, like just having kind of a load balancer or reverse proxy make decisions based off various rules. I was kind of illustrating it just at your browser level with different hosts, but there's many different ways to do this.
One key factor for me though, is making your application and while you're writing your application code that you don't have to think about this. So in my example, where I had any framework using the query filter in a partition kind of environment, but you could do the same type of thing like I mentioned. So when you create your instance, you're just passing in what the token is. So you know what the tenant ID is. So whether you can do the, um, the query filter or connect to a specific instance, you don't wanna be thinking about this while you're writing code. While you're writing your application code, you want this to be seamless. You have a token, you pass it in, you get your context out. You don't have to think about writing a particular where clause or how you're getting data out. It just feels like you're always in a siloed environment. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.